I feel extremely honoured uh, getting to speak to you. It's been a while since we last spoke, Steve, and well, thank you for thank you for joining. Not at all. I enjoy it. I, you know, it's a pity we can't travel around as we used to. I still remember Stephen Krashen playing the piano uh, on the sidewalk in Montreal. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't realize that the street sweeper was coming along and we're going to remove him so that they could uh, clean the sidewalk. But uh, <laughs> that's not. So, Steve, yeah, I have to ask. Yep. The pandemic's happened since we were last together. Right. In, in Tokyo, in, not in Tokyo, Fukuoka, yeah. In Fukuoka, yeah. And right. so I mean, that was kind of the last time we got to be together in person and to break bread. Right. And I'd love to hear from you what has changed and what your learnings are after that whole, you know, sort of global change. How are things for Steve Kaufman now, before and sort of towards after COVID? But... I mean, I'd be interesting, interested to hear Stephen Krashen's view on this, but... I mean, I think at this age, we kind of, you know, go with the flow, roll with the punches, whatever comes at us. We, it's not, you know, yeah, obviously prior to the pandemic, uh, my wife and I did a lot of traveling. We were in uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Myanmar. We were in, uh, we were in Ukraine. We were in uh, South America. We were in Morocco. We did a lot of traveling. And of course we haven't been traveling the last little while. Uh, to, uh, Fukuoka was probably the last sort of major trip. In so far as my language learning uh, activities are concerned, I've kind of been stuck with this Arabic and Persian because Arabic is actually a lot of work. Like I have spent more time on Arabic. I know far more words in Arabic, at least according to the statistics at Link, but I understand Persian much better. I can carry on conversations in Persian much better. Persian is much easier. Uh, you know, I had a uh, sort of a chat with Sahra, who's my tutor. She lives in Iran. And we were talking about, you know, Iranian identity and all kinds of stuff. I couldn't possibly do that in Arabic. So there's just so many words in Arabic. It's amazing. And then you add to that the fact that there's Levantine and there's Egyptian and there's standard Arabic. So and, and I'm determined to become good at reading the stupid language. If I had just focused on being able to say a few things to go down and order my shawarma, I'd be well ahead of the game. But I want to be able to read comfortably. And it takes a long time. We can understand theoretically how the writing system works. But to get to where you can actually read it comfortably, I mean, mm -hmm. as it is right now, I can read uh, Polish better than Russian, even though I know Russian much better than Polish, because it's written in the Latin alphabet. And that's just the Cyrillic alphabet, which is actually no big deal. So when you go from that to the Arabic script, so I've been stuck trying to get better at that. And uh, sometime, sometimes I think maybe I should just focus on Persian because I'm never going to get significantly further in Arabic. Um, so I mean, that, that's my present situation. Other than that, what has changed? Well, I think what has changed is, you know, things are continuing to advance insofar as the you know, the way information is is distributed on the internet, you know, the, 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 the Netflix and the way uh, we can choose stuff of interest to us or stuff of interest to us is suggested to us. And uh, the way we can, uh, lots of this stuff is constantly evolving. And this has implications for language learning. Uh, even things like, you know, automatic transcription has improved a lot. So if I put a podcast in Persian on to Happy Scribe, I get an 85, 90%, 95% accurate transcription, whereas it used to be 70%. That's still not ideal. Like, really? I'm looking forward to the day when we get 99.9% .9 transcript. We get it with punctuation because, mm -hmm. again, I like to study these sentence by sentence on link. And if it, on uh, automatic transcription, there's no punctuation, so I might end up with, you know, eight, nine lines of, of text in a paragraph. So I'm, I'm looking forward to um, automatic intelligence, making it easier for us to learn languages so that I can go say to my computer, get me something that's 10 minutes long, a pleasant female voice talking about the Iranian revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it'll go find the audio or the text. If it finds audio, it'll give me text. If it finds text, it'll create audio. The audio will be pleasant to listen to. 
So that's the world that, uh, that I see we're kind of at the beginning of. So those are the things that I've been looking at over the last little while, particularly since I can't go. Like I went to Morocco and spoke some Arabic, uh, you know, um, it's not, it's not so easy. I mean, obviously if you go to Brazil, you have a, you have an army of teachers. Yeah. You just take a taxi for 30 minutes and uh, you've got tremendous conversation, you know? So yeah, those are some of the things. I mean, taking on Arabic though, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's no mean feat. I mean, you say you went to Morocco, but had you been studying that variety of Arabic? I mean, no, but what's interesting is it's interesting. Arabic, so the fact that I'm not progressing very far, it doesn't matter. It's still enjoyable because I'm discovering uh, even a little bit of Turkish that I did. I discovered a little bit. So even it's not lost, right? But uh, because the Moroccan, uh, the Arabic in, in North Africa is so different, a lot of people do speak standard Arabic. So I would get into a taxi and they'll speak to me in standard Arabic. Uh, in a restaurant, just typical, you know, restaurant, uh, flies and your camel, <laughs> not quite, but you know what I mean? Like very local restaurant yeah. and the, the owner lady, very, you know, uh, hustling and bustling type of owner lady. She spoke, she was delighted to humor me in standard Arabic. On the other hand, I don't know what it's like in Lebanon, but if I get into a, a taxi in Montreal driven by a Lebanese, I'll say something. In those days, I could only say anything in standard Arabic. And he was, yeah, it sounds to me like you're speaking Arabic, but we don't speak that kind of Arabic. Uh -huh. And finished. <laughs> no more conversation. <laughs> so to that extent, North Africa is not a bad place to go and practice standard Arabic because their version is so different. Yeah. Whereas the Lebanese, the Egyptians, they can all speak each other's dialect and they all more or less understand each other because they yeah. watch their, their, their respective movies and stuff. So... So yeah, uh, Morocco, they, a lot of people could speak, like even a, like a taxi driver, any, a lot of people spoke standard Arabic. They have it at school, that's what their language of instruction is, and, and they use it. So with, it's more of a, like more of a diglossia with, with the- I wouldn't even MSA. say it's diglossia, it's more of the French, like, and, and the interesting thing there is if you go up north, it's Spanish. But if you're down in Fez where we were, it's French. So they can easily switch into French or up in Chef Chauan, they can switch into Spanish. But if you insist on speaking standard Arabic, they will humor you. But it's not something that they would use amongst themselves. <laughs> no, I guess it's just school, isn't it? It's the school yeah, language that school you, language, you'd yeah. be using. Yeah. And, yes. and, and Persian is an interesting choice. I mean, I mean, I mean, my home language is Macedonian and we have mm. lots of Turkish words. And right. everyone talks about them as being Turkish words, but actually most of the words that are from Turkish that we use are either Persian or Arabic in origin, very mm -hmm. often the Persian or Arabic. Yep. Um, and yeah, I've got to say, when the whole pandemic thing started, just before it started, I was also wanted to start learning Persian. And then the pandemic hit and all of these wonderful uh, groups started to form in languages that I was planning for my retirement and I couldn't resist. And I thought Persian's not going anywhere. But obviously for, for us from the countries we're from, going to Iran isn't the easiest place to get to. So oh. when you started on this journey, was your plan to eventually go and use it in the country no. or was it just at home? So the, the, this is my sort of progression towards Persian. Uh, my wife and I uh, were planning to go to uh, Crete and Israel. Okay. So I decided to learn Greek, which wasn't that difficult. And I thought I would try to tackle Hebrew, which was difficult. Okay. And uh, I found it very difficult. And what made it even more difficult was when I was in Israel, mm -hmm. there is no one there who doesn't speak either Russian or French or English. That right. person doesn't, doesn't exist. So very quickly, you didn't need the Hebrew, except when I was in a parking garage and I was confronted with this uh, machine that spat out, you know, the ticket so that I could get out of the damn parking garage, 100% in Hebrew. So there's no way I was going to get out of this parking garage. Fortunately, I found someone who helped me. So, and then we walked across into Jordan. We went to Petra. And I said to myself, there's 10 million Hebrew speakers in this world. And there's 350 million Arabic speakers. Why am I going to learn Hebrew? So, okay, my family is Jewish, but I was never exposed to the religion. I'm your non-religious Jewish person. Carmen, of course, is not even of that background. So, I mean, theoretically, I have a connection with Hebrew, but it would be interesting to learn. But I said, no, I'm going to go for Hebrew, or at least for Arabic. 
And then I come back to Vancouver and there's no Arabic speakers. <laughs> there are some, but I never come across them. But here in, uh, on the North Shore here in Vancouver, you cannot go to a store without running across an Iranian. Like the, the, there is no store. My doctor is Iranian. The pharmacist is Iranian. Pharmacist is Iranian. Everybody's Iranian. They run everything here. So I said, if I'm going to go to the trouble to learn the Arabic writing system, I may as well learn Persian. So a Persian, and then I said, well, now I'm into the Middle East, I may as well go after Turkish as well. And you're quite right that there's this 15% common vocabulary, uh, some of which is of, of Arabic origin, some of which is of Persian origin. I'm not sure that much of it is really of Turkish origin, but it's more because, as you know, the uh, Persian was sort of the, the, you know, the Latin almost of the sort of Central Asian, Northern Indian, you know, Mughal, whatever world, the Turks were the warriors and the administrators were the Persians. So I think a lot of the Turkish Persian looking words come from Persian and, and mm -hmm. may not necessarily be, uh, you know, Arabic, but a lot of them are Arabic. And there's a lot of, there's, I don't know, they say 15%. I, I haven't counted them, but there's a lot of common vocabulary for sure. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, you know, even days of the week in Turkish, some of those are Persian. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's really interesting when you start sort of diving into the etymologies because it helps you to also remember things, right? And you make these connections. And I think yeah. doing the Arabic, and even if you say you're not going to advance far with Arabic, it's still really beneficial to have that knowledge, right? To have that experience because... It enhances your your appreciation and your your awareness of, of the other languages of the region. You know this this um, Robert Bjork, who is a professor down in Stephen Krashen's part of the world. Uh, he does very interesting videos on different subjects, on you know interleaving, learning and forgetting. And he makes this point that a lot of the stuff that we learn and then forget, relearn and forget, we're throwing it all into our reserve. Mm -hmm. So everything that you expose yourself to even if you can't retrieve it, it's into this reserve. And so we want to build up our reserve. And, and in a sense, that's what I'm doing with Arabic because I'm, I'm now focused on Levantine Arabic. For a while, I was focused on Egyptian Arabic. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is I'm, I'm quite confused now, worse than I ever was in trying to speak the language. But if I listen to an interview and the guy being interviewed thinks he's speaking standard Arabic, but is throwing in all kinds of Levantine or Egyptian words, which they do, then there's a better chance that I'm going to under, understand what he's saying, even if he if he's supposed to be speaking standard Arabic. So it's all a part of building up that reserve. Uh, and, and gradually, your ability to retrieve things and remember things is only going to improve. It's not going to get worse. Uh, but that stuff can sit in your reserve for a long time. You can pull it out, use it, and then lose it again. And then you go back and get it again. Yeah. So, you know. What, what made you choose? I mean, you... The, these are some of the questions that we've got in the chat, but I, I, I yeah. it, it's a nice lead on. Um, Susanna asked, you know, how what led you to say Egyptian and then to Levantine Arabic? What was what was the initial? Okay, I'm going to go for Egyptian, and then what was the change? What happened? Well, uh, you know, first of all, you get lots of advice from Arabs. Okay, <laughs> you must learn standard Arabic because that's the language of the Quran. Okay. You must learn Egyptian Arabic because it's better or something, uh, or all the movies. Or you must learn Levantine because it's the closest to stand. They all got their reasons, okay? They're all, you've got champions for different forms of Arabic. But ultimately, it's, it's the content that drives. I'm, you know, I want to lis listen to interesting things. Uh, movies are too difficult for me. If I watch an Egyptian movie, I don't understand it. Or Levantine. I understand, like, I grab a word here or there, but I don't really understand it. Um, so it just so happens that Levantine Arabic, I found some very interesting items of content. There's a cartoon series out of Jordan, which is phenomenal. And it has subtitles both in English and in Arabic. And if I import that into Link, I get timestamp snippets that I can go through. So I get to watch the video with the subtitles. I get to go through the text. So that was really motivating because it's fun and it's funny. It's like the Flintstones. It's like really, it's very funny. Then I found MTV Lebanon, and it's very interesting there again because, and there they're talking Lebanese, but they're talking about different warlords and politicians, and you know, down Lebanon, they've all killed about ten members of the other group, and they, you know, it's just a pretty. They play for keeps in Lebanon, but so it's interesting. You get to learn a little bit about Lebanon. So I'm sort of guided by whatever I find that's that's interesting. I haven't found 
an equivalent. I, I find that Egyptian, I don't know, there's just not much, there's no sort of like political discussion in either standard Arabic or Egyptian on television there. I think it's those societies are more uh, restricted in what they're allowed to say. Whereas in, in Lebanon, there's no holes barred. Uh, they're, they're on there. <laughs> you know, the Christians, the Shiite, the Sunni, they're all on there stating their position. So yeah, it's just more interesting. That's all. Okay. I mean, and Hadrian actually re raised a really interesting point. And you started in the beginning saying the script, you found it very challenging and yes. getting into it and reading it fluently. But this is coming from somebody who studied Chinese and Japanese <laughs> and, and yeah, and Korean. So, how, how, I mean, <laughs> how, how do you manage with those and how is it easier or harder or is it just okay. different? Well, I don't know what the effect is of going from right to left, whether that's an obstacle or not. Uh, I find Korean easier to read than Arabic. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I've read more Korean. Korean is more phonetic, you know, sort of one for one phonetic. Once you understand the system, it's fairly consistent. Not the case with Arabic and Persian. Not the case with Greek either, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so not the case with English either, of course. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, between that and the fact that the... Uh, I, I just continue to see little letters that look the same to me. That I'm not <laughs> sure whether I'm dealing with ra or f, for example. Okay. Uh, you know, so the sort of inconsistencies, the fact that the, the the form of the letter varies depending on whether it's the beginning, it's at the beginning or the middle of the end of the word, uh, going from right to left. I'm just finding it's not that I can't read. I I can, but I'm I'm never totally confident that I know how to pronounce the word. So unless I know the word, I tend to go to text to speech fairly quickly to get a sense of how okay. I speak. Now maybe that's a maybe that's a, a crutch. And if I didn't have that, then I would read uh, on paper and I'd get better. That's also possible, but I'm lazy. <laughs> so I read online and go for the text to speech. Well, you're honest. That's it. That's one thing. I think that's a, it's a good quality to have. To be honest oh, yeah. with you, the um, you, I mean, there are some people who will transliterate as well. Where do you stand on transliterations of these languages? I, I don't use a transliteration. I, I don't find them that helpful. A lot of transliteration is very poor. Like, I don't know if you've done any Korean, but their transliteration is impossible. And uh, even like in Japanese, you've got different schools. You've got the purists who will say a word like hachimitsu, which is honey, right? Which if you follow the Japanese phonetic system should be written hatimitsu. Mm -hmm. Because it's ta chi tsu, ta chi tsu, right? But if, if you're writing your transliteration system for a non-speaker, then it should be hachimitsu, because that's how it's pronounced. So I find a lot of transliteration not that helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, even like if you're going into Levantine Arabic, for example, the k word in standard Arabic disappears in Levantine Arabic. Yeah. It's a h uh, in Persian. You got to hear it. Like, I'm not a big fan. As you know, I'm not a fan of the international phonetic alphabet. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a fan of all these attempts to represent the sound. I kind of have to hear the sound. Okay. I mean, it, it makes sense. Um, I mean, you know, hearing the sound, if you don't hear the sound, you can't reproduce the sound. And I yeah. think probably people who even advocate the use of the international phonetic alphabet would agree with you on that point. Um, that if you're not hearing it, the representation for some people may be a, oh, it's the same representation as another sound I can already make. And they're right. not quite hearing it as the same sound, but it actually is very similar. So if they start from that point, then they've got to... It's, it's a real trap. Like I always mention, like I had this, we had this Spanish girl working with us and she would say as a, as a sword, okay? Like a sword. I say, no, no, sword. Okay, yeah, yeah, sword. Like bound and determined to give that, that word the value that those letters have in her language. Uh, my father was like that. He lived in Canada for 35 years. He, had a he would beat us in Scrabble. He had a tremendous vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But it bothered him that the province of Nova Scotia was Nova Scotia. It should be Scotia. Nova Scotia. T-I-A, Scotia. What's wrong with you, English speakers? <laughs> so people have a tendency to be influenced by the writing system, whereas they should be focusing on what they hear. It's not Nova Scotia. It's Nova Scotia. 
So rely on what you hear and not what you see. So I'm not a big fan of transliteration. No, and so I guess then also because words sometimes change pronunciations, right? Uh, within yes. a society. In my own lifetime in the UK, I remember we used to call it Haiti and then it changed to Haiti. Yeah. And I don't know whether that was the influence of North America and how you pronounced it in English. But in the UK, from the news pronouncing it Haiti, Haiti it went this to this Haiti pronunciation. And the, but the spelling says the same. Yeah. I mean, what can you say? We have a guy who works with us who's Russian. He's actually Moldovan, but speaks Russian. So to him, he's been in Canada for 15 years. It's Taranta. It's not Toronto. It's Taranta. And he's got a place on Lake Simcoe, Lake Simca. So he's not hearing what people are saying around him, right? He's relying on the fact that an unaccentuated O in Russian is A. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's an interesting observation, actually. Do you think there is something in that then where when people learn, is it you have to actually train them to listen and to hear? Yes. yes. As a first step. I am a big believer in audio. I think I'd, I'd be interested in, in uh, Professor Crash's thoughts on this. Like, like reading, like writing is recording. Writing, recording is the same. It's a record of something that someone said. So it starts mm -hmm. with sound. So people have trouble reading. I believe they need to do what I do on link. Like I listen to the story many, many, many times. Then when I go to read it, I have some momentum. I have, I have a sense of, of what that's supposed to sound like. And, and so I'm focused on the sound. Like when I started learning Chinese, for the first month, I only did pinyin. In those days, it was the Yale system. So that when I go to learn the characters, now I have a sense of how, of what that sounds like. So I think the sound, audio, so reading I, is the best place to learn vocabulary, but the audio is a big part of, of, of reading. When we read in another language, we sub-vocalize. I always do. I think most people do. Even in your, in your own language, it's, it's instant meaning. So you don't need to sub-vocalize. At least the good readers don't. But once you're reading in another language where you typically aren't as good as you are in your own language, we're sub-vocalizing. So audio, audio is key. Audio is key. Getting people to hear, hear before they read. It's interesting you mentioned that with Chinese learning pinyin. Um, so Vlad Skultetti, you you may you may know of Vlad from. Uh, I heard the name, yes. I don't know him personally. Yeah. So he spoke at the Polyglot Conference in New York, and he talked about his language journey. And one of the languages he he learned to a very high level is is Chinese. Uh, he lived in in Taiwan for for a number of years and studied Chinese at university as well. And one of his criticisms of university and teaching of Chinese is the focus on the tones too mm -hmm. much to the point that you end up like a nodding dog and right. and I think I, I think this probably fits in quite well with what you're saying how was that for you when you first started with Chinese and did it change when you started focusing on just listening to it was there a change at all well there's so many things that we don't notice in the beginning so if I go back to that first month when I was listening to these Chinese dialogues where we only had the, the transliteration and it seemed to me they were speaking so quickly, like there's no way I could get a sense of the individual tones of the words. Everything was happening so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but I agree with, uh, what was his first name? Vlad. Vlad, I agree with him. I think it's like so many things, it's the effective filter, Dr. Crash. Mm -hmm. Effective filter. If you make people so concerned about an issue, whether it be cases in Slavic languages or tones or whatever, then pretty soon they start tripping themselves up on these things, mm -hmm. like the old centipede that doesn't know which leg to put forward first. You know, uh, you cannot speak Chinese if you're trying to remember the individual tone for each word. You are going to get them wrong. You're going to get them wrong anyway. But mm -hmm. you won't even be able to speak if you're trying to remember which tone it is. I found it, it, it again gets back to lots of exposure. And I said that when I, where my tone started to improve was when my teacher gave me a cassette tape of these Xiangsheng comic dialogues where these comedians exaggerate the tones. 
And mm -hmm. even if I didn't fully understand them, because a lot of them have literary or historical references that I didn't understand, I wasn't really laughing where I was supposed to laugh, but I, I heard the rhythm of, of, of how they exaggerated the language. And mm -hmm. to get the tones right, you have to get into the rhythm of the language, almost to exaggerate the rhythm of the language, not feel self-conscious about it. Again, going back to your friend, Stephen, the fellow with the beret who pretended to be a Frenchman, <laughs> you, you have to kind of throw yourself into it. Uh, but if you try to do it by trying to remember, is this the first tone, second tone, whatever, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. And, and at least, and getting back to your question, at the beginning, you don't hear any of that. It's, no. it's, there's so much that we know after six months that we don't even notice I I at the beginning. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a question related to this that I noticed when I was studying in Czech Republic many years ago, I was living in a Czech family. So I was speaking Czech a lot and I got very much into the rhythm of the language because I was hearing it constantly. Mm -hmm. But I was very conscious that my grammar was far from perfect. And some of the right. cases were just completely fluffed for want of a better word. But what I found really weird was because my accent was fairly good, people didn't hear the mistakes. They mm -hmm. auto-corrected them in their heads. Mm -hmm. They say, what are you talking about? Your grammar isn't good. It sounds brilliant. And I was like, well, I know for a fact that I sort of fluffed some of those there. When it get, there will be a point, and there, there always has been in my life as well, where I've then had to reproduce the language in written form and someone's gone, oh, you got that wrong. How did you not know that? You don't say it that way. Why are you writing it that way? And I don't know if you've had this as well. Is this something you've experienced? And is it something that you think will autocorrect as well at a later stage? Or do we need to focus on re sort of going back through with a bit of a fine tooth comb after we've got the language in our heads and just correct some of the, tweak some of the grammatical points to make sure we're writing it correctly? Well, I think a lot of things we will autocorrect. You know, and I get back to this example where people say, well, you know, uh, the only reason kids speak uh, their native language properly is because their mother corrects them. That is such absolute nonsense. I, on that basis, no children of immigrants would ever learn to speak English in the case of North America correctly, right? So no, most of the, the errors we make, we gradually self-correct because we hear more and more of the language. Mm -hmm. But you know, a child of an immigrant in North America hears so much of the language that they will eventually autocorrect everything. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in fact, uh, a native speaker who grows up with people who don't speak standard, uh, you know, <laughs> forms of grammatical, whatever, they'll, they'll end up speaking incorrect uh, English. But for a learner, it's a little different. And I think there is benefit in going back. You're, but I think we're always more conscious of the errors we make than people listening to us. And I've heard people say with regard to Slavic languages that, well, you know, the endings are not so very different that uh, it doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. uh, you know? And, and so, uh, I mean, I, again, I get back to my Russian colleague here. He doesn't use articles. Mm -hmm. For him, articles don't exist. They don't exist in Russian. They don't exist in English. He communicates extremely well in yeah. English. No one begrudges him either his accent or his lack of articles. So yes. maybe, you know, Slavic speakers are fussier or less fussy. I don't know. Uh, but it's a bit of, a, it's a, bit of a, a difficult thing, you know, this whole issue of things that don't exist in our own language, like mm -hmm. case endings. Uh, I find that when I'm away from, say, Russian, I get worse. If I'm together with Russian speakers and we're speaking and I'm hearing Russian, then I get a little better. But I will recede again when I'm not using because it's not natural. It's not something that we have in our own language. So how do we train to be better at it? Just spend time with the language. And I have gone through grammar books. I have gone through, I have a great book, by the way, for Russian called Russian 53, you know, patterns. God believe in patterns. So for every pattern in the language, there's like 10 examples. No explanation, just here's the pattern. And I read through it. It has some effect. It's, it's you know, you never know how much effect it's having on you, how much you actually retain, but it's a fun thing to do. It's always fun to, to read something like grammatical explanations or even a glossary if you're reading stuff that you already know. Mm -hmm. Then it's kind of reinforcing, or at least you think it's reinforcing because you, you, you recognize that word or that rule. Whereas if you don't have that background, those words just go right past you. 
or grammatical rules go right past you. So if you're reviewing something you already know, then I think that it's good. At least it's, it's, you have a feeling that it's rewarding. How much it improves you, I don't know. I think ultimately it's just your exposure to the language with people, reading, listening, talking, you, you do improve. And you have at some sense, because we have all read the rules. Like even though I say I de-emphasize grammar, I have read the rule. I know theoretically the instrumental case or the whatever date of case, how it's supposed to work. I can't yeah. necessarily produce it on the fly, but I know how it's supposed to work. And gradually we get better sometimes. So, I mean, I guess also that what you're doing then is kind of an X-ray of a body. Um, let's pretend the lang language is a body. And I always think of it as the grammar is the, is the skeleton and then you, you hang the rest of it on the skeleton. And right. it stands up, right? Because whether it's reading a book or whether it's looking at a grammar and analyzing how things work, linguists tend to focus a lot more on the skeleton and a little bit of bits of flesh, but not all of it necessarily. They may not put the muscles into it to make it to work fully, but um, you, you, you would do some sort of analysis. And uh, nothing conscious. In terms of analysis, I think that the, the a language is more of an amorphous jellyfish type of structure. Okay. And, uh, you gradually get more and more familiar with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I think of some of those rules in Russian uh, governing, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, verbs of motion, it's, 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 it's theoretically, yeah, they're trying to describe something that's natural, but you can't nail everything down. You know, it's like this issue in, in English of the order of adjectives. Mm -hmm. yeah, there is a natural order of adjectives in English that the native speaker naturally follows. But to write that rule would be difficult. Mm -hmm. And to then try to apply that rule would be even more difficult. However, if you hear enough of the language, you will naturally put the adjectives together in the appropriate order. Yeah. And get them wrong occasionally, which doesn't matter either. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter. I mean, even even monolingual speakers of languages will make mistakes in their own language. I mean, how many okay. people who speak English will say pronunciation instead of pronunciation, for example? Right. And they may hear it correctly and incorrectly several times, but they'll still they 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 won't necessarily analyze it in that way. And I think from that point of view, some of these things with the grammar or vocabulary use will potentially never go away, and it doesn't really matter. Sometimes I think, like you said as well, we come at a language when we read or when we study or whatever we do with the language, we come at it with our own schematics for with linguistic knowledge that we have from language or languages that we already speak. And especially when a language is similar to a language you already speak, it almost feels like that process of acquisition is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed with somebody who was learning Macedonian and was a Russian speaker, they came at it obviously with the Russian the Russian language mindset, the Slavic mindset. And mm -hmm. obviously all Slavic languages have things in common. But there are elements of Macedonian grammar that are borrowed from Turkish. And one of them is the mish form from Turkish is used in Macedonian. And as a Russian speaker, she's been speaking this language for over 10 years and spoke it very, very well. And I, I asked one question about this. I said, how on earth did you figure out what that meant? Because it's the last thing that monolingual speakers of Macedonian learn as a child. They probably start getting it right about nine or 10 from my observations, nothing scientific there, but my observations. And they may still get it wrong a little bit even beyond that. And it's quite late for, for a language, for linguistic, you know, grammatical um, elements of the language to be getting corrected. For, for a first language speaker, but that's the way it is. Anyway, I mentioned this and I said, you know, it looks like the L form for the typical past tense of Russian, but obviously there's a different meaning. And she looked absolutely shocked <laughs> because this had never been explained. Because the, the thing is, is you can use that form and mean one thing, but actually be understood slightly differently. Like you could never use mish in Turkish Mm -hmm. and still make sense unless somebody you you have some way of understanding what the, the differences are in turkish i think it's probably easier over time to read but in macedonian definitely not and it's not as as clear cut do you think that if you've got to a level where you can speak well 
then a grammatical explanation could actually be really beneficial to, to just clarify it. Well, you know, I, I believe in meaningful content. Uh, I am motivated to improve in all the different languages that I speak. If there were sort of a resource on whatever, uh, Czech, about Czech grammar, entirely in Czech, with audio, uh, you know, explanations and examples, no tests. I don't, I never do tests, quizzes. I hate those. Then I would, I would do that. I'd sit in my car and listen to this explanation of Czech with examples. And I think it would have some, it have a beneficial effect, but only in the target language. No, no explanation in English. Uh, but it's, it is amazing how very fluent speakers, for example, of English, still have examples of sort of the transfer from their own language. Like I know Swedes who speak mm -hmm. English very well that I've done business with. And they will say, it is many people in China. Mm -hmm. Always. Because that's how you say it in Swedish. It is many people. No, there are many people. Mm -hmm. But in Swedish, it's... or Germans who say, I uh, have been living in Canada since many years. Mm -hmm. a standard, standard for a German to say that. Yeah. That's not how you say it. So, so it's amazing how it's so difficult to shake, you know, things that are ingrained in us, in our own native language, they're hard to get rid of. I, I have to say, I mean, as much as I, I agree with a lot of what you said, there was one thing with this Mish form when I learned it in Turkish. I, I went to a Macedonian um, so teacher who was a first language Turkish speaker and taught the whole course in Turkish. But when we got to Mish, she literally... By the way, I don't know what Mish is. I don't know what you're referring to. Well, the, the Mish way. is this kind of form of a verb where you weren't necessarily present to witness it. So... So, for example, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, there were so many different forms for different potential situations in Turkey. Yeah, there are so many of them. It, it gets crazy. Yeah. yeah. But what I what I found really useful, even though the whole course was taught through Turkish and there were lots of stories and everything that, you know, uh, Stephen Krashen says and you say on this topic, I, I agree with pretty much everything you say. And um, but one thing they, she did for this, she said one line in Macedonian. And say this is basically this form in Macedonian, and the Mish form just made sense then because it was a direct. Okay, yeah, okay. I don't, I don't really need much more of an explanation because it set the, it set the tone of where we were going, with the rest of the, the things we were seeing. You could just automatically see the the reference. I, I don't, I don't. I mean, I know this is a little bit further away from from what you yeah. would normally say, but um, and not like in courses potentially as well. No, but there's so many different things that potentially can help us. And there's no mm -hmm. question yeah. that we notice many things, we autocorrect many things, but there's lots of things we don't notice. And these things can be pointed out by a teacher, can be pointed out reading a, a grammar book, can be pointed out by you watching yourself on a video or you attempted to speak a language. There's so many different ways okay. that we can help ourselves, you know, find the gaps. But yeah. that's not what the major emphasis should be. That's all. And I think what I think what's so valuable in what Stephen Krashen says is, unfortunately, still now the yeah. emphasis on is on teaching something, and then testing you on it. That's sort of yeah. the dominant mode still. And until you have had massive exposure to the language, there's no way you're going to get it right. You might get it right for the test, mm -hmm. and, and I, we see this in so many different places. The emphasis should be on comprehension and communication. And yeah. like in Canada, for example, if you work for the federal government, you get a bilingual bonus. And so they test you. And if you get the subjunctive wrong, you don't get your bilingual bonus. There's lots of French Canadians who don't use the subjunctive correctly. There's lots of people, Anglo-Canadians, who don't get the subjunctive right, but who can sit in a meeting, say in Ottawa, understand what's going on, contribute, participate, Mm -hmm. even while getting the subjunctive wrong. And then there yeah. are people who can get the subjunctive right, who can't sit in a meeting and don't understand what's going on and can't participate. Yes. So th there's something very much wrong with, with what we do in, in language instruction, language testing, and the whole works. Yeah, this is, this is really interesting because I had a conversation with uh, Maria, uh, with Deutsch, Deutsch mit Maria on YouTube. Um, and she was talking about this as well. 
about the the whole testing and then actually what she finds more rewarding is getting people to know the language mm -hmm. to a point where they're, they're consuming things that they enjoy they're able to use it they, they feel that the the learning of the language is actually secondary to the enjoyment of the language right and i think that is a really key thing isn't it um absolutely absolutely and and it's a practical thing that's that's a I mean, think of all those people on the Amazon where there's 55 different languages and they all communicate with each other. They don't carry grammar books with, they're not tested on the fine points of their respective languages. I was going to look for Stephen Crash's book here that I picked up in Taiwan, but I don't have it handy. It's all there. Short little book. I can't remember what it was. The Taiwan Lectures, Stephen. But uh, it's, it's, it's not, you, you don't want to become like totally religious on this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like to believe that you can, you know, the idea that you're going to only have compelling and comprehensible input, it's not possible because when you start out, it's not comprehensible. And if it's not comprehensible, it's not compelling. So mm -hmm. there has to be a period where you're dealing with stuff that's kind of has been made a little more comprehensible for you, or you have some tools like audio and you have link, for example. So it enables you to access stuff. But eventually, if you're going to stay the course, it has to be compelling. Because, you know, once you're in that, that, first period where you're trying to get a toehold in the language, you need to be spoon fed a little bit. You might get an overview of the language explanation, overview, whatever you're doing stories. But then you get to a point where in order to continue, you've got to find compelling stuff. Otherwise you aren't going to say the course. And you I mean, you mentioned something interesting at the beginning, finding that compelling stuff is challenging, right? So how do you do it? Well, uh, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to disagree with the guru, but I, I basically accept the fact that in the beginning, and that's where we developed our mini stories at Link. These are stories that are essentially silly. They're not tremendously interesting, but they are stories. So it's not Duolingo. It's not disjointed phrases. It's a story. You know, Mary goes to the shoe store. She looks at two, two you know, pairs of shoes, a black pair and a blue bear, pair. Doesn't matter. It's a story that hangs together as a story. It repeats five times so there's a lot of repetition within the story i listen to those stories and when i look at my statistics at link i'll have listened to them 30 40 50 times not all at once i go story one story two story three i don't understand i go back to story one so i i, I accept the fact that in a new language even with a weird script like arabic or persian i'm going to be spending a lot of time listening and reading it's not very compelling but i need to get that repetition but I go back to Manfred Spitzer, who says, you know, to learn, we need repetition, but we need novelty. So we need interesting things. So initially, the language is new to me. I'm motivated. So I'll deal with these stories. But come a point comes a point where I have to go find things of interest. And so that's so my pattern is always start with the mini stories, two, three months. And then I want to go and find stuff of interest, genuinely compelling. So you can now, actually put yourself classroom, in that might be a different scenario. It might be a teacher acting stuff out for me, but I'm not in a classroom. So I'm learning entirely on my own. You, you, you can put yourself in that zone to make yourself sort of just persevere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and any... I'm listening to stuff like that where you're hearing it over and over again. And each time you hear it, you listen to it, you notice something different. And so, and, and it's also very easy by the time you're listening to it for the 10th or 12th time, I can be doing that while vacuuming or cleaning up in the kitchen. It's, I can't, I, if it were genuinely interesting, motivating stuff, you know, I can't be doing something else because I, I, I'm interested in what's going on here. But if it's sort of largely repetitive, I you kind of zoom out, zoom in, it doesn't matter. So yeah, I use those a lot. I even go back to them. Even after I progress to more difficult stuff, I go back to that early, sort of to the gym, to the workout room and, and work out as well. Yeah. And because one of the things that I get I get asked as well um, is how to, to motivate yourself when when particularly for some languages where there's not much available, you know, yeah. um, you know when we're talking about indigenous, endangered, and vulnerable languages where there's a limited amount of resources available, and um, and if you're going through things that you're finding just boring, um, but you're persevering with them and saying you're sort of driving yourself forward how do you stop it from becoming white noise that you just block out and it not you know you say you're vacuuming but it's going in it, it, and you're going in and out you're you're conscious of that right but how do you make it that it's not white noise 
or does it just become white noise for some languages and you just say that's it no if i'm talking about the many stories i all i in fact i enjoy them because we get if we are doing something that we consider to be slightly difficult like trying to understand a mini story in a language that i started two months ago i get a sense of satisfaction to the extent that i'm able to understand what's happening and to the extent that i find new things that i hadn't noticed before i actually enjoy it and i like to vary the sort of easy rewarding you know listening to stuff that i can more or less understand as opposed to going to if i listen to my mtv lebanon uh, you know, Beirut Al-Yaum, where I understand 15% catch the odd word. I need to get that sense of I'm good. So I go back to the easier stuff. But insofar as uh, endangered languages, like I think what has to happen, and I've been approached by people in Canada, and I say, look, if you'll get us content, get people talking, people who still have the language, get them talking to each other and get it transcribed, and we'll add the language to link. But so often it's like a lot of this stuff gets bound up in, you know, government money. How can I get funding? I want to write a grammar and yet another grammar of the Cree language. We already have lots of grammars on the Cree language. What we need is the language. What we need is, is a, 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 you know, a large, uh, basically uh, corpus of people talking about themselves recorded with transcript and, and build it up as a reserve. And we'll figure out then how to use that to learn. But don't don't yet another white consultant gets more money from the government to do a, a, a grammar on some endangered language and far too much money is spent on that, as opposed to simply getting people to talk in those languages while we still have speakers of those languages. You know, actually, it reminds me because I, I had a conversation with Leanne Wilson, who is in the Cornish language community, and I met her through the Cornish groups that I took up during the pandemic. And one of the things that she and a number of other people are in that community are really involved in is creating Wikipedia articles, mm -hmm. content in Cornish that they want to translate, books that they want to translate, and they're just constantly churning out materials. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's not a language where you have to worry so much about you know how you're pronouncing it compared to the writing system. It's It's fairly phonetic in terms of the sounds and the and the letters match up fairly easily once you you know how it works are there native speakers of cornish there are again yeah so there are people who um have spoken to their children they've grown up speaking cornish um so they, they they've successfully brought it back from not having any native first language speakers again to to having a a number of, of children born using it mm -hmm. um just do they, I don't believe there's a school like on the Isle of Man, for example, for Manx, where they where they actually use it as a as as, as a sole language to teach children. Uh, I think that would be a great step because then you really you're learning maths and science and history and whatever else through a language, which really brings the language to life because you're you're learning things you can talk about um, as well with with lots of other ch other children, your peers, and with your teacher, and you're interacting and hearing stories and stories that relate to you and the world and things that you're going to hear about you know one thing thinking about the other day with uh, artificial intelligence we know essentially how latin was pronounced mm -hmm. i think you know and so you'll get italians speaking the way they thought it was pronounced and germans and slavic people and all kinds of different things but if we had if art if text to speech was so good that we could actually get a natural sounding voice, pleasant, which we don't have right now. Right now, text to speech is hard to listen to beyond uh, a sentence, right? So that you could actually take all the works, you know, that are written in Latin and convert them into audiobooks, the pleasant to listen to audiobooks spoken in Latin as it was pronounced then, but in a way that doesn't seem artificial. That would be amazing. Or and ancient Greek for that matter, or ancient anything for that matter. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. I think it's getting better. And I think we're on that path. I think you said at the beginning of this uh, discussion that that is where we're going and you're enjoying seeing this development yeah. of technology to, to improve and to help us in the process of learning languages. Mm -hmm. And in fact, last weekend, I was saying to Stephen just before, I spent the weekend at the Memorize offices and they've they've been working on on, on software to actually be able to have conversations 
with a, a voice as mm -hmm. well. So you can actually say things, pick scenarios, okay. whatever. And, and you have a conversation. And right. I tried it out in a number of languages. And it was actually <laughs> quite interesting. I mean, we're, you can see we're in the beginning of something yes. really quite great in that we've already got software available that can predictively write uh, an entire thesis or dissertation. You just yeah. give an idea of what you want to write about and, and, and the AI will just create this <laughs> huge text. And you can imagine, right, for Link, this is going to be huge as well because you're going to be able to get these. I want to know more about, I don't know, Saturn. And you put Saturn in, in the language, in your target language. And eventually we're going to have a point, I guess, where it's just going to give you an entire essay about Saturn. Yeah, with audio. And then you'll be able to get the audio as well. With the text to speech, but of a, of a natural and, and comfortable sort of, yeah. It's I mean, I, I, that's what I see. We're going to say, you know, you say, I want a 15 minute article on this subject, uh, female voice, uh, Northeast Macedonian, if such a thing exists, whatever. <laughs> you can there are some dialects there that you can some use. Dialect or whatever, you know, Sardinian. And uh, you're going to get it. Wouldn't that be wonderful that we could get yeah. to that point where we could just do that? And I mean, and, and we also have the technology as well to make things simplified. So you can actually simplify language. There, there are websites, I believe, as well, that will will take something and distill information to mm -hmm. summarize things. And this for comprehensible input, potentially. But the, the, the trap there is it's a bit like, you know, graded readers. I think there is something to be said for authentic. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, for, I have never wanted to read a book in a sort of a simplified form because I'm afraid it'll deny me the pleasure of eventually reading it in its, uh, in its true form. Mm -hmm. And so we can get carried away with AI as an assist, but ultimately it's like, you know, how much time do you want to spend talking to a dummy? Uh, you know, to a machine. <laughs> I, ultimately, you want to speak to a real person. Depends what time of dummy you mean. I mean, I mean, you could be speaking to a dummy anyway, Steve. I mean, let's be, <laughs> you never know, right? <laughs> yeah. No, but I think authenticity is important. But but this is the world. So in any case, I don't think that artificial intelligence is going to make it unnecessary to learn languages. If anything, it's going to make it easier to learn languages. Yeah. No, I really like it. What a, what a really positive way to sort of to, to start wrapping things up have you got any final thoughts that you want to share anything else that you'd like to um give well, us your pearls of wisdom steve I, I unfortunately i can't find that i want because i want to take advantage of the fact that stephen crashen is here mm -hmm. and say that the extent to which he has simplified the process of language learning anytime you can take something as an academic and instead of trying to make it more complicated you make it simpler, easier, more accessible, then you're doing something very important. And everything, and I didn't know the name Stephen Crash until I went to Taiwan and everyone was swarming into this lecture hall and, and, uh, and who's he? And then I got the book and stuff, but everything written there, it basically matches my experience in learning languages up to that point. So you can pick around the edges of it and say, yes, but you need grammar. Yes, you, you need output, you need this and that and so forth. But fundamentally, what Stephen Krashen has described as the way we learn languages, meaningful messages, our desire to understand what is said, our desire to say something back, that's at the essence of language learning. And everything else is, you know. Mm -hmm. Wonderful way to end. Wonderful so, way to end. Yeah. Thank you so, so much for joining and okay. for thank sharing. You. And um, yeah, I really, really appreciate it. And I look forward to the next time we get to see each other. But also, in the meantime, chatting online works very well, too. But, very uh, nice to see you both. Yeah. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>